Well, uh, I've got to say this, that uh, I have oftentimes uh, uh, referred to the guy that's about to come up here and speak with us as a little turd because he grew up in the, uh, the ghetto of our 15th Street neighborhood and uh, ran around with my, my nephews and my nieces and uh, you know, watching him uh, grow up. And part of the story that he'll tell you is that I uh, got to watch him just absolutely wander in the world that we live in, absent and void of a relationship with God. Uh, but uh, to God's glory and to his praise, uh, he found his way through the darkness and made his way into the light. Uh, and I am so very blessed and honored uh, to call him my brother. Jason Carr, get up here. Give him a hand. I like your shirt too. Yeah, uh, the lady got me. Yeah. Does she like when you call her old lady? I guess. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered. I just thought about that one. I just wondered. I just, I'm just going to try to get you in trouble right by the onset. I'm like, oh man, we don't need to throw that out there. <laughs> well, this is Jason Carlisle. Uh, man. Jason has uh, such a great story, such a great testimony, um, uh, like most of us, um, life didn't always throw its favor uh, his way, uh, and so sometimes, man, he had to begrudgingly just fight through days and get through days, oh, yeah. uh, but man, here he is today in the house of God. Uh, I don't know if you all ever noticed this or not, but... If you want to find somebody that will pray for you, and when he says he'll pray for you, he'll pray for you. And he's always faithful to be here at the altar before yeah. services. Uh, it's this guy right here. Oh, yeah. And so I appreciate that. Because I've said this before, man, that uh, the old evangelists, sometimes they would say, you know, that get a hold of the horns of the altar. Right. And uh, I said, man, if you got to put a saddle on that dude, ride it all the way to heaven. Get on that dude and go. Whatever you do. Man, pray, pray, pray. So tell us a little bit about uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Jay. How, how I guess uh, where we start. Uh, I guess the the drug addiction started probably when I was 13, 12. I don't remember when my dad and mom got divorced, so that that was that's really, right. Yeah, that's really hit me hard. So I started, you know, smoking weed, you know, and then. Uh, you know, that was back in the 90s, so that's when all the hip-hop was out, you know, you, you got with the gang stuff, you know, yeah. started running with them, and um, Coke was pretty big back then, and Cat, you know, you didn't really hear about meth, you know, too much, but mainly Coke and weed and stuff like that. Yeah, my mom worked really hard, went out and bought me a pair of shoes one time, brand new, you know, I traded them for a half brand with cocaine, you know, right off the bat, since she gave them to me. Same night, you know, just just to fit in, really, because I couldn't read or write. So, you know, I went to school all like that, too. And I didn't even go to class. They just told me I had to show up, you know, I had to graduate. So everybody thought I was a clown in school because, you know, I never carried no books with me. I just did what I wanted. I mean, I got kicked out from gang relation, just doing stupid stuff just to fit in, you know. And, um, I, I did that for a little bit until I was about 16, and then I got into the math really good. I was doing math, you know, and um, started stealing, started, I don't even know who I stole off or what I did. I mean, if I Just could, if I could pay anything them, to maintain that yeah, habit. You know, and that's what I deal with today, you know, I wish I could pay all that back, you know, but I really don't know. Like, I've done so much stuff, I feel so bad about it, it's, I don't know. And, um, you know, robbing drug dealers out of India, you know, just stupid stuff. I mean, stuff I was wondering, I'm still alive, really. You sure, know, sure, yeah. Um, I probably burnt so many people for as ripping them off and stuff. I mean, you know, and I, when I'm walking in the gas station or something, I, I know, you know, that I've done some stuff, but I really don't remember who I did it to or what I did, you know. I just know I, you know, burnt some people like that or whatever and I wish I could pay it back so I mean I don't know. So do you like do you, you like run into some of those people though and like you're like, you're I, like okay, so. I know I got over on you. 
you know, right. I did something to you because well, they got looking at you. You know what I mean? I'm like, I, I don't know. But I really don't know what I did to them, so it's hard telling. Right. I wish I could pay that back. and That's why I come to the altar, really, because, you know, even though you get closer to God, I think it's harder when you get closer to God because you deal with a lot more stuff. You actually find out who you really are and what you really did, you know? Yeah. And, and all the people, you know, you hurt and stuff. You know, this truth, brother. So when it comes time to, you know, like when you're trying to live by the word of God and you want to make amends and you don't know how to make it, how to make amends. Right. And there are some people, there are some people, and you know this, there are some people that they are just absolutely positively never going to give Jason Carlisle another shot. Like, no, it don't matter. No, no. It don't matter how often you come to the altar. It don't matter how far you pack your Bible. It doesn't matter how much you preach, how much you tell people about Jesus. Because that's right. That's the nature of an addict is that we know how to hurt people badly enough mm -hmm. that, man, they'll never give you a second opportunity. They'll never give you a second no. chance. And the thing is, man, I've never been much of a fighter or nothing. I, you know, really, I ran for more fights than I have fought. But man, I work for a movie company, like, and when I go to city stuff, I don't, I don't know if the devil gives me or what. But I've done some wild stuff now. Like, I mean, you know, it's off the chain. Like, I don't know. I mean, I've been in the Bronx in New York City and walked down straight in the ghetto. The only white guy straight got drugs off of him. I mean, this <laughs> unheard of stuff, you know. Right. I held a 38 special to a guy's head, and I would have pulled the trigger if he thought twice, you know. This is the kind of mindset. You know, and the only reason that was is cause so I could fit in, you know. But when I always came back to Bedford or something, I was totally different. I was totally out of, like, I always had to be somebody different because I was around my mom or my grandma, you know, they kind of kept me in line, you know, and, right. and, and I didn't want to be like that because I didn't want to be that kind of person, but it's just being around certain people, they kind of bring that out of you, you know, and, right, so how does that feel, man, I mean, feeling like, you know, like, uh, like other people uh, almost can manipulate and control you, right, yeah, that's the thing, and I'm like, you know, you know, and that's the thing. You can be absolutely, you can absolutely be so strong in some areas, and then all of a sudden you find yourself so weak that you just fall off the hand. And you think somebody tells you. And they didn't know, but right after, right after I did some, I was like, man, why'd you do that? And I felt, and I beat myself up all night, probably all week over it, you know. And they didn't have no idea I was doing that. They was just, like, you know, thought I was cool and I was doing what they, you know, I don't know. Right. I don't even know why I would do something like that. You know what I did, and uh, so I mean, morally, there was a good character in there. There's a right, there. there's always yeah. been a good heart in there. Oh, I yeah, yeah. heart that's I like, like, man, I want to be strong, man. Yeah, but, I mean, most of that I was high, you know, so right. I, I guess that had a lot to do with it because you're not in the right set of mind, you know, sure, especially if you ever smoke crack cocaine. I mean, that'll put you in a mindset like no other, like you're raw still, whatever, you know. Right, right, you know, right. I mean, it's like so, from your own family. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's like you mind like everybody. That's the same way. You get so far out there, you just you're not even you no more. You know, you just. I mean, I've even had my own family tell me, ask me who you are. Like, yeah, you know, talk like, about that for a minute, Jason, because that's so true. Because yeah. I know there are so many families that right now they're dealing with people who and. Even, mm -hmm. even worse now, the heroin addiction. Oh, man, and, and they look at their family member, uh, and so people say, my God, that's your kid? You right. raised them like that? You did this? You did that? People are so critical and so judgmental. But even that individual, even like you were saying, even yourself, you look at yourself and think, who am I? Uh, yeah, and then you don't even notice because you're high and you just, you've been in that wild for like good six, seven months. You don't notice. But, you know, I go around my buddies now and I can look right at them and tell them they're, they're just gone. And I don't think they notice what they actually look like because they'll look at you and say they ain't on nothing and they ain't doing nothing. Uh, and you just sit there and say, yeah, you're on, you know. I mean, but I don't think they realize how they looked or how they act sitting there falling asleep and stuff. Like, I mean, I know my mom and my sisters, you know, they've seen me nod out on the couch several times, you know. And, Right. I, I just be acting like nothing's going on. And then, you know, I see me hurting them, but I didn't think there was nothing 
nothing wrong because I ain't hurting nobody else, you know what I mean? I'm just hurting myself. So right. that's how a lot of addicts look at it. You know, so, but you don't realize the damage you're doing to your family. You're just tearing them apart, tearing them apart, you know, and you got nephews watching you do that and then they grow up to be like you because they think that stuff's cool and you know yeah. and then yeah. now that you're older and trying to change and you try to go with them, they're like you know, they I mean, it gets it it a, a lot harder to get somebody yeah. to change for the good yeah. after you've already directed them down a path of destruction. And that's what I deal with now. That's why I always come to the altar because I just, I can't change what I did. You know, like the way they're living, it's all because of me because they see me do it and they think it's cool and it's not. Right. It's really not because there's so much more to life than that, you know. I mean, you, you burn a lot of bridges, you lose a lot of relationships, I mean, and I know. You know what's crazy is like, man, do you really ever have like, do you really ever have like, I mean, there's that one or two people that are really friends, but you have a lot right. of associates. You yeah. call them friends, road yeah. dogs, buddies, whatever, they, but it's literally a game to see exactly. who's going to burn who all the time. Yeah, your family's pretty much the only people you got when you get locked up or when something tragic happens. It's so really the drugs is what takes over them, you know, they don't, that's all they care about, you know, that's all I care about when I was getting high, I didn't go see nobody or do anything, I mean, you know, especially when you get on the heroin, I'm so glad I'm off that, but man, that was a ride for it, and I love it, I mean, I absolutely love heroin, I'll tell you that today, I love heroin more than life, is. I mean, I, 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 can, I cannot be around it because it just, it's, it's it kills me because that's got that much control over me. Still, I mean, still today, yeah, still today. How long have you been saved, brother? Well, it's uh, almost three and a half years, or five, four, five years. Yeah, I'm, my my uh, memory is lost because I I mean I've been so high for the longest time. I mean, there when I tell my story, I jump from pattern to pattern. I mean, I might go forward, I might go back. Because I really don't know. <laughs> like the times and like how old I was or any of that because it just happened so fast. You don't realize, I mean, 20 years ago down the road and it's already passed and you can't change that because, I mean, it goes by quick. You how old are you now, Jay? Uh, I'll be, uh, You'll be 40. 40, yeah. It's pretty messed up when you go so to so how old you are. No, I mean, that's, right. that's what I was saying. Yeah, absolutely, the drugs, yeah, the drugs, yeah. the drugs can decay our mind to that point. I mean, especially, you know, you look, uh, and, and so young people listen, man, you, know, you think, well, that'll never be me, I'll never do that. At 13 years old, yeah, it, st it, 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 it start, starts out with, you know, hey, I'm just going to get high, smoke a joint, right. uh, take a pill, uh, hang out, just be cool, you know. Uh, and then it's really, it's all it takes, man. It's just absolutely captivating, control your life. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not, it's not a story that's uncommon, right. but addicts everywhere. And it's, the, you know, the government's in on it now, too, because they, they're not in all these uh, states to allow marijuana and stuff. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, don't, I mean, marijuana, is, I mean, it's been around longer, but, like, it's really not, it's not good for, I mean, no, I get it for the medicine or whatever they're doing with the pills and stuff like that, yeah, but the growing and stuff, that just, that's just a gateway, and it is a gateway. I wish I would have listened, I mean, because you start smoking in, and then, you know, your buddy's bringing in the speed and whatever. You know, you don't really see like rupees or any of that kind of stuff anymore, like clay, clay leaves and like, I mean, back in the 90s you seen that. I was doing them at like 13, 12 years old, you know, I mean, you could find them anywhere. But, and like acid is real big nowadays. I mean, I've been hearing a lot of people about that with the shrooms and stuff. Wow. I mean, it's awful, but in heroin is just, oh my God, it's, it's flooded. Let me ask you this, man. I mean, uh, so talking about like the heroin epidemic and how bad it is, been, man, because I know, uh, I, I really, I honestly cannot tell you how many funerals I did just last year that were directly related to someone who had OD and died. An opiate addiction, yes. Uh, of an opiate or, or heroin addiction. How, yeah. many, how many friends you lost, man? Oh, um, a lot. At least about six or seven. I know of uh, Evan. I lost well Willie Kelly's husband. That really hit me hard because you know we shot up every day together and uh, we shot up that morning. It was about 
four o'clock in the morning, you know. And I knew he had some stuff on him still, but I mean, it was an everyday thing with us. We always shot up, we always had something to shoot up, or we wouldn't be able to function the next morning. Right. You know, I mean, and he ended up dying that morning. You know, and that didn't really hit me. I worked all day knowing that he was at the hospital dying. It didn't really hit me until I got off work and actually knew he was dead. You know, that's that little girl's dad that he's not here no more, but like, you know, I have to look at that, you know, like, man, I wish I, I wish I would have known now what I did then because maybe I could have changed something, you know, but it just, really what me and him was doing, we didn't, we just stopped caring about everybody. I mean, that was our focus. We would go out, do steal, get junk, whatever we could just to get that high. And once we was high, you know, that was fine for a couple of hours, but we did that nonstop every day, just trying to get as much as we could. You know, we'd shoot a gram if we had it, you know. Right. But it only takes a tenth. I mean, just a little shot to kill you. I mean, that's all it takes. It, you don't have to have that much. You it's know? even worse now because they, 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 not that it was ever good. No, no. But, you know, uh, drugs today are being cut with fentanyl, car fentanyl. Right. I mean, literally. It's got diesel fuel in it. I mean, it's got, I mean, just crazy stuff. If somebody would actually sit down and read you what they all put in, it's just unreal. I didn't even know that when I was doing that. But now they're mixing it with cocaine and with the heroin, they call it speedball. See, I started getting into that. Yeah. And that's a serious kind of, I mean, it's all serious. Like, you could die from. So, I mean, man, we. It is know, hard to get off of, I do know that. You know, you've lost friends. Uh, You've almost lost your own life. I mean, we know how it breaks relationships. We know oh, about, yeah. We know about uh, the jail sentences, uh, the time being locked up. Those are days that you never get back. Those are taken from you forever. Those are days that you never get to spend with that beautiful family. Right. Uh, I mean, today you still deal with the ramifications. And, you know, oh, yeah. and, and here's an amazing thing. You know, Jason is... Here's what I like, man, is that he is just absolutely open, he's honest, he's transparent, he's very, I don't want to tell you what, folks, we need more of that. Yeah. We don't need people to sugarcoat and yeah. to play the addiction game with us anymore and to, and to tell us that, you know, do this step and that step and this step and that step and this and that and things will be all right man you know hey it's just a temporary problem you'll grow out of it no you may not uh, and the reality is is that he still has a family uh that has surrounded him with love you know uh his sister she still loves him with all her heart she's sitting there yeah and she's, she's sitting there through quite the run it's a wonder, really. Right. Um, like, let me ask you this, Jason. I mean, uh, after going through after going through all of that uh, and experiencing just years of heartache and headache and heartbreak, what was it? What was finally the defining moment where you said, "Man, I have got to do something different"? And what drew you to want to know Christ Jesus? Uh, I've actually always really knew him. My grandma was a Christian. She's uh, she's pretty much always blessed God and like always brought God into my our lives as, as we was growing up and stuff. And uh, you know, uh, I've gotten baptized like three or four times before when I was younger. You know, and I, I did good for a couple months, but it's just every time I got out, you know, I I was I was good while I was there or in rehab or wherever I was. Even got baptized in uh, shows jail. I was fine when I was in there. I was going to church every day, everything. As soon as I get out, though, you know, your friends come around, and you know, and first time I got high, man, I was like, why did I do that? You know, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to come back from it because I was already, my mind was already starting to speed up. Like you know, how you get all sketchy, and it's yeah. But this time, I got a good nine months in there. And I knew, and plus Willie done died, and plus Evan Blakely, he done, he died a couple of years before Willie, and just, like, I just got to thinking, like, you know, and 
I just couldn't hurt my mom or anybody no more. And I, I had to straighten up. And God was actually finally starting to answer me because when I, when, like seven years prior to that, when I actually started banging real heavily, doing a couple grams a day or whatever I was doing, I could felt the shame that came over me. Like, you know, he cut me off completely. There was no, there was no signal there at all. Like, you know, and that's the bad thing. A lot of Christians don't understand that. Like, when you get close to God and you, and I guess, pee on you another, I don't know how to say right, that. But right, why right. you throw it back in his face like that, right. he will cut you off. And, you know, and it takes a while to get back to me. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm just now starting to get that. You know, I'm just now starting to get that after five years trying to do the best I can. You know, I've had a couple of slip ups when I got out, when I got out this time. I, I, I've smoked some joints, you know, here and there. But you know, since we got our house, we've been going strong. We have, I mean, it's been great. So and tell, I, I can develop up every. You know, I mean. Tell me about that, man. Tell me about uh, after you got real serious about uh, your relationship with God. You saw the blessings that He was starting yes. to pour out. Uh, on your life, how's things? How's things going for Jason Carlisle now? Uh, you know, I used to say it like this: right. uh, BC, you know, before Christ, and then you know, like AD is actually on a mountain, but you know, like after Christ, man. Once you got serious, uh, because that's what it takes. It right, takes right. absolutely being committed and saying, yes. "Hey, I can't play a game. No, you can't go I can't anymore. play church anymore." Yes, he will. I, because he will cut you off. He will. He will cut you off. Because the Bible says that God said in his word, in the book of Revelations, it says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Yeah, there's no way. That's to be lukewarm. Because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Yes. Uh, and so, that's literally the state and the condition that we put ourselves in, man. I mean, we can just absolutely be void of God and a relationship with God. Or... Uh, man, I've seen the fire in this guy. Mm -hmm. I've seen, I've seen the fire uh, that is brewing in him. You know, like when I said, "Hey, Jason, you know, uh, I, I want you to do a testimony time." Hey, there wasn't no hesitation. There wasn't no saying, "Oh, I'm nervous." So, right. I mean, he's like, "Let's do it. I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Tell somebody about Jesus and what he's done in my life." So, tell me a little bit about that, man. I'm always trying to figure out a way to tell my friends. You know what God's done for me and they can't I mean sure God they can see like I mean I own my house for a year and a half like I've got a truck Crazy. I got God, everything because of Christ I mean I wouldn't have it before and you know I lived off I mean I you know I didn't have nothing till I got out this time I mean my mom always supported me she was supporting my drug after therefore meant to get me started for in the morning so I could go out and still get the rest you know like, I don't bum her $20 every day off of her, you know what I mean? Right. You can get a 10 for $10, you know, up in Indy. That's two, two balls right there, you know. I mean, you, that gets you started, you know. But I don't know. I'm, just, I'm glad to be with And I walk, and like, my friends, I get online, I start telling them about how good God's done for me. Me, personally, I don't know how to talk to them about God because I'm still dealing with my my attitude and stuff so when they uh, and a lot of times I feel like I push them away from it because of how I act or maybe I because I can't read or write so I just go off of what people say as they're preaching you know what I mean and a lot of you know and people say different stuff so like I ain't ever actually read the Bible you know but I, I know right from wrong and that's how I live and I think God looks at your heart anyways and Right. But when I go to tell people about that, you know, it's like I don't know all these verses and stuff. I just try to tell them like what God's done for me and like look at look at me. You know, if there ain't a God, how how can I have all this? How can I, you know? Right. I think it's awesome. Right. I mean, like even on social media, like when I see your Facebook posts and I see you in the corner, I see that you guys are doing yard work yeah. and paint. Every day, yeah, every day, working hard, every day, going after it, every day, uh, painting fences, staining decks. I, I don't know, I think I see where you got, you built a camper or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just, just crazy stuff, you know, the things that you would think that, you would think that's absolutely insane. 
Why, why are they doing that? Because he has occupied his life yes. with something new, a relationship with Christ Jesus. Man, we should be shouting and applauding yes. the fact that those same hands uh, that led you to do so many destructive things that, listen, Jason, yeah. just because you can't look at this right. and interpret what it says, it doesn't mean that God hasn't placed it in your heart. Right, right. The Bible says to be a hearer, uh, not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word yeah. also. I just live off the serenity prayer. I, I say a prayer every morning, God grant me serenity, except the things that cannot change, but courage to change the things that can and wisdom know the difference. And, uh, you know, I live by that, and I just, you know, I don't... A lot of people, you know, everybody judges people, but I really don't. I, I mean, I, no, I, know you don't. I, I don't, and I just, you know, and if anything, I beat myself up more than I do anything, you know, because it, I put a lot of, a lot of that on me. I don't really, yeah. I'll tell you what, uh, Jay, I love your heart, man, uh, and I love the fact that, uh, I got to saw this this little kid right. grow up and 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 see you go through the struggle and the fight uh, that you went through. And you know what? Some people some people might look at Jason Carlisle today and say, "Well, that's not that big a deal. He's not that successful. He don't have a million dollars." Bank. He's not driving a Cadillac, man. He doesn't live. He doesn't live right. in, a, in a five bedroom, four bath, uh, three story mansion. Yeah, right. That's what most people are on now. They they idolize all this stuff that's around us. Like that, that definitely don't go with you. You know what I mean? And when you get to heaven, you're gonna have way more than that. And I mean, just I mean, that's just. Yeah, the old evangelist said it best, man. They yeah. said, uh, never seen a U-Haul follow you to heaven. No. You can't take all that stuff with you. But Jason got something that uh, not only can he take with him everywhere he goes, but he can share it with everybody he meets, and that's the love of Jesus in his heart and his life. Right. And I got to tell you right now, brother, I am so proud of you. Uh, I am honored. To be able to call you my brother in Christ. Amen. I am honored uh, that I have the opportunity to baptize yes, you. Yes. I'm honored that even though I can't get her to come up here and talk, yes. that you met the love of your life. Yes. You met somebody that has stood by you through thick and thin. And not only did you get the goods, but she got the goods yes, too. Yes. And uh, it is an absolute joy to watch you two walking that pathway of righteousness together. You make my you make my day every Sunday uh, because sometimes I'm in such a rush to do things, man. Trying to get things ready to go for service and stuff, man. Got all this stuff right. on. I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off, and all of a sudden I look over and there's Jason Brand. I'm thinking, man. He's doing the most important thing that we should be doing in service right now. And that is talking to God. Yes, he is great. And I'm thankful because I don't know this, but uh, I, I, I've always assumed that uh, when he's up there every now and then he's throwing in a word for his pastor to say, hey man, he'll go read my day, man. He's running around like a chicken with his head cut off. You know, honestly, the worst prayer comes out of my mouth. Dear everybody, Father, I like to just pray for the whole world. Just have them, please, let them have peace for just a minute. Wow. And that's my, that's what I pray for the whole world. I don't just, I figured it's easier that way. Because there's always somebody out there who's dealing with something. Or some kid living on the street. Or some kid getting beat by, you know. I mean, just, there's great, I mean, there's people out there that's had it way worse than me. And I, and I should feel privileged, you know, like. And then kids that don't have no family are just, I've seen some awful stuff in my life. I mean, it just, you know, Thankful I think the whole world needs prayer, you know. More now, more than ever, you know. Yes, yes. 
see all the crazy things that are going on. Uh, man, Jason, I'm so glad that you gave your life to Christ. Yes. I'm so glad that I have got to know you. I'm happiest today that I can look at you and I can't just say, hey, buddy, hey, pal. Right. I can look at you, man. Come on, say brother. I can say, this is my brother in Christ Jesus right here, man. And I love it with all my heart. And all my life. We all, we all, we all, we all, we all. And today I know it's kind of short, sweet, hard to beat tonight, man. But <laughs> I appreciate you sharing with us tonight, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> How many of y'all appreciate Jason just being honest, man? Uh, mm, take that, devil. That's what these testimony time services are about. It's about hitting the devil right in the mouth. Yep. Saying there's another one that ain't afraid to stand before you. Do you know how terrifying it must be? I just stand here before you and say, hey, I may not know how to read and write, but I know how to love and I know how to serve. How to love Christ Jesus. I'm going to serve him with all my heart and all my life. You got me, brother. Yeah. You got me. That's a good one. It says here in the Word of God, in Isaiah, uh, one well, of the 39th chapter it says this in verse 29 it says he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might he increaseth strength so that means you ain't got to have it all you don't have to have it all figured out you don't have to be able to speak eloquently and you don't have to be able to do everything with great swelling words and and, and the way you see these big televangelists do it, brother, you are a living testimony of the love of Christ Jesus, and you just keep doing what you're doing, and God is going to supply for everything that you need. He's going to give you the mind, the strength, and I believe today that by the holy appointment of God, He's going to put the words in your mouth that are going to win multitudes to the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Goes on says that yes, it says uh, it says in the in the forty first chapter of the same book of Isaiah it says fear not not for I am with thee be not dismayed for I am thy God I will strengthen you I will help you I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness and so whenever you think you ain't got it man whenever you think you can't go God's got your back. God's got Jason. God's got Nicole. I wish I could get Nicole up here to talk with us too. Uh, they just have such a great story, such a great, uh, uh, a great testimony uh, as individuals, but together, man, I see they just blow my mind because they're so beautiful. Uh, because I see not only the love of Jesus in each of them. But I see the love of God as He has unified them and made them one. Uh, man, keep building trailers, keep doing silly stuff, man. Drive the cold crazy, man, but keep doing it for the Lord, amen. And you two just keep hanging in there, man. Uh, keep preaching the word the best you can, man. Share the love of God everywhere you go. Let somebody know about Jesus. It goes on and says this, and I'm going to close. In the book of Matthew, uh, in the ninth chapter, verse 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Now, listen to what this says. Listen to this, Jason. Then saith he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. You see, we need more people like Jason. Because there are people out there that need to hear about Jesus. Right now, there's somebody curled up in the ball, laying in the middle floor in this community that we live in. That's either a breath away from their last or fighting and struggling with everything they've got to hang on for one more day. 
whether it be addiction, whether it be depression, whether it be financial woes, whatever it is. We've got people that are hurting today, man, and they need to know about Jesus. And I've said it so often, man, hurting people hurt people. And so we wonder why we see so much hurt in the world that we live in today. It's because they don't know where to find any hope. And God said, man, the harvest is plentiful. I can't find anybody to go tell them. I can't find anybody to go tell them about the hope that is in Christ Jesus. So he said in verse 38, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's why these testimony services are important. Because God is preparing people to share the word of God. Because God is about ready to harvest us up out of this place. Amen. I hope and pray that you never take for granted the story that you've got. The testimony that you have. Your testimony may be entirely different than Jason's. But your story is still of great value to somebody. And it may be just what somebody needs to hear. To know Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. So whatever you do, don't let the devil shut your mouth and silence you, but go out and share your story. The Bible said not to be a light that was hid under a bushel. To be a light that stood on a hilltop and said, hey, I got something to tell you. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to the Father except by Him. Amen? Amen. Just stand with me tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you tonight. Thank you for such a wonderful service. Father, I pray everyone under the sound of my voice, whether they're watching us online tonight or whether they're here in this sanctuary with us, that God, they know you as Lord and Savior. Father, I'd love nothing more than to take even more people through those baptismal waters come Sunday. But God, before I can take them through those waters of baptism, need for them to know your son Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so my prayer tonight, Lord, is through the testimony that has been shared here, that has been given here, that Lord, somewhere, someplace, somehow, that you have reached out and touched somebody's heart in such a way that right now, they would take the time to say, God, forgive me. Forgive me a sinner. Forgive me of the wrong that I've done. Forgive me that your son Jesus had to die on a cross because of the wrong things that I've done. And yet thank you Lord that you allowed that to happen. Because today is the day that I want to ask you into my heart and into my life. I want to be saved. I don't want to die and go to a devil's hell. I want to make heaven my home for eternity. And so today is the day that I ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And I pray and ask it in His holy name. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Man, if you pray tonight and you ask Jesus into your heart and into your life, maybe tonight you just said, man, I just need to rededicate my life, man. I need to get serious about my testimony. I need to tell more people about Jesus because the days are drawing close when God is going to return for His kingdom here on earth. And those that are left behind are going to be lost forever. It may be your story that may reach my child. It may be your testimony that may reach somebody else's loved one in this room. So we're going to keep having testimony time on Wednesday night because I like it. And I think God likes it too. And I think it's helping build character. And I think it's helping build strength. And I think it's helping build the church. And I think it's helping to show people that we don't have to be ashamed or afraid to declare to the world that we live in today that we are Christians. Amen? Amen. Put your hand together for the Lord tonight. Give him a hand. God bless you guys. Thank you for a great Wednesday night. I love every one of you. Come back and see us Sunday morning at 11. Don't forget communion. We've got somebody being baptized. Amen. And we're having a soup dinner. So invite everybody to come. And if you absolutely insist on bring something, 
uh, bring a dessert or finger food. Bring some good dessert. Uh, my favorite is banana pudding. God bless y'all. Have a great night.